Good morning, this is Jim Moore. You're watching Words of Encouragement, program number 441, on Wednesday, the ninth day of March. I can't believe I remembered the whole thing. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I am an unabashed, unashamed Jesus follower, and uh, part of my goal is to help you be too, and I hope you want to be that. Amen. Unashamed because Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and my words among this sinful generation, I'll be ashamed of you when I stand before my Father. And uh, we don't want that. Amen. And again, as always, the Lord does that to protect our hearts from allowing the influences of the world and other people uh, to sway our faith in Him. So, Anyway, so it's a good day today. I uh, pray that things are going well for you. The sun is out, the weather is cold, and I am sitting in my nice uh, warm spot here in Texas. And um, yeah, it's just been an exciting uh, few months as the Lord has suddenly and dramatically uh, shifted uh, some of our doings. Uh, just like to give always a quick update. Um, but I will make it quick. And then I want to explain the picture I used of a four of a kind, okay? The, the picture of the cards, the four aces. I'll do that in a second. But I just want to let you know that uh, we have had a word from the Lord, we believe, quite a while ago about traveling and ministering and writing and so on and so on. And so the Lord um, has been pushing us toward that goal for actually many years. And then here last year, <clears throat> things fell uh, together in place. And, um, and so we've moved on that. Now, a lot of people, uh, or excuse me, a lot of times, and I've actually been in conversation with some people recently, <clears throat> where the movement of the Lord, in order to help you get to where you need to go, <clears throat> sometimes conflict happens. The children of Israel uh, for, you know, slavery and... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, brutal oppression by Pharaoh, and it caused them to leave. Um, the early church that was pretty well locked into staying at Jerusalem, a persecution arose and it drove them into the planet, and the gospel was spread throughout the world. Sometimes if God wants you to move, he will allow difficulty to help provoke that, and so he did with us, and uh, and so anyway, it's always good is what I'm trying to say. The Lord is always good. He's always doing good things. So what changed in our perception of our process was not what we would be doing, but how we would be doing it. And this is also very common. Often the Lord will tell you something he wants you to do, and then we do him the favor, uh, the gracious favor, of telling him how we're going to do it. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we think we have the word of the Lord. We think we, we fill in the blanks, in other words. And then suddenly God will come along and say, no, that's not how I want you to do it. So anyway, so let's say we're here right now. And uh, I, I'm specifically saying that about Texas because it plays into the prophetic uh, experience that I had yesterday. And uh, this is interesting because the Lord actually gave me this word yesterday. And... Um, and I'm starting to get that he doesn't always have to do it on my time clock either. So anyway, uh, glad you're joining me today. I uh, hope this is a great day for you and pray the Lord's blessing rest upon you. Make sure you come on and say hello. And uh, as long as I can see you, I'll say hello back. So, all right. So again, day 441 or program 441. Um, and this is March 9th, 2022. Four of a kind beats a full house. Four of a kind beats a full house. So let me just back up for a second, and then we will get into some scripture. A uh, couple, well, yesterday I was uh, laying down to take a nap. Yes, I do like to take a nap, okay? Um, yeah, that, that is indicative of my age. So Holy Spirit, help me. <laughs> Debbie, God bless you. Nice to see you this morning. Hope all is well with you. So, uh, 
as I am laying down to take a nap yesterday, um, didn't hardly sleep at all, but uh, good morning. But at the end of my nap, just before I woke up, I had a, what I would call a mini dream. I don't know if that's biblical or not. <clears throat> but the, uh, it was a very short dream. It only lasted just a moment or two. And I just saw a picture. And what I saw was a picture of four playing cards. And, uh, and it was four of a kind. And so I, I don't remember if it was four aces like the picture I put or four queens or what. I just chose aces because that's a picture I found. I don't think that's significant, but um, when I saw it, it reminded me of a prophetic word that uh, Bob Jones gave a number of years ago that honestly, I didn't pay a lot of attention to. It just didn't strike me at the time. And uh, this prophecy, or I don't think it was a prophecy. I think he might have had a dream where the Lord spoke to him. I don't recall. And I looked on the internet to find that prophetic word and if there's anybody out there that knows uh, how to get a hold of that and wants to give us the link to it I would that would be greatly appreciated but basically what he said uh, was well let me go back so I had this dream and uh, I saw this and I woke up and I got up and I sat down in my uh, love seat there next to the one I love uh, my Lin Linda and uh, I turned on my my phone and you know how they have all these advertisements in I think this was was in Facebook now I just want to say I, I don't play cards uh, the reason I don't play cards well no let me let me just I don't do it very often there's once in a while I think I played Uno and I'm, I'm not a big game guy I don't do games a lot not that you know sometimes people think every time you, you say you don't do this is because you're really against. I'm not really against it at all I just, I don't know why, it just doesn't appeal that much to me, so, uh, but I, it appeals less to me playing poker and blackjack and things to do with gambling because of my own personal background. Uh, my dad was a great uh, one for gambling, he loved to gamble, no disrespect to my, my earthly papa, but uh, he did a lot of that, and so it kind of tainted my view of it a little bit so let's just leave it at that so anyway don't I'm not a poker player I've forgotten how to play I used to play those of course when I was a kid uh, but I've forgotten how to play I have no idea the difference between you know one game of poker five card stud or you know blackjack I remember a little bit because it's 20 21 I think and um, like Texas Hold'em I don't, yeah whatever don't know so anyway I open up my phone and I look at uh, an advertisement I'm scrolling down through my page and they give you all of these involuntary advertisements that you don't ask for and um, so the very first ad that I came up the very I, matter of fact I think it was like came on the screen when I opened it up I, at the most I scrolled down one or two it was the picture I saw in the dream moments before okay so I was speaking to someone this morning about this. Often, prophetic. I consider myself a prophetic person. I do believe the Lord uses our surroundings as signs and wonders to us. I know that you can go overboard or underboard with that. You can see a sign in every flake of dust that falls through the air, or you can be the one on the other extreme that just believes that nothing is a sign, everything's coincidence. One of them, uh, you know, is obviously overboard in that direction. The other one basically denies that God would use anything in the earth to talk to you. And I don't believe that. I think he used a lot of things. So anyway, for me to open up my phone, see that, and then, um, you know, go, wow, that was what I just had a dream about, is a message. So as I asked the Lord about that, he reminded me, and actually, I don't remember if I thought about it in the dream or out, but I was reminded of uh, the word from Bob Jones. As a matter of fact, I think it may have been not long ago that someone spoke about it on the internet. Anyway, I don't know all the details, but here's the main point of the four of a kind. It has to do with agreement. It has to do with unity. The Lord honors when we come together and agree. I'm going to um, 
read the, one of the number of verses in the Bible about that. And um, the thing that the Lord spoke to Bob was about how he views our coming together. Now, I respect people's opinions and how we see things as human beings and so on. And there's always arguments. Yeah, well, what about this? And what about, I, I get all that. But however, my, my greatest desire is to be into agreement with the Lord. Good morning. Is that J Jasmine? I'm sorry. I can't see very, I'm far, far enough away from the camera. I can't see very well. Jasmine, God bless you. So, Ultimately, you and I will stand before the Lord and to the level that we were in agreement or disagreement with him will be, that'll be kind of the criteria for what happens next in eternity. Everybody does not get the same thing in eternity. The Bible says he rewards each person according to something. That, that infers that People's rewards will be on varying planes according to something. I'll let you look up what that according is. The ground is level at Calvary. Nobody pays for salvation. We can only accept it. But how close we draw to the Lord in this life, the whole series of sowing and reaping, even a cup of cold water will receive a reward. Well, that means if you don't give the cup of water, there's not a reward for it, right? I mean, it's just it's really common sense. It's not that complicated. Agreement with God is everything. Hi, Leanne. God bless you. Agreement with the Lord is tantamount. It is, it is so important. Uh, our, the power of agreement is what this message really is about. And so in the vision, I'm trying to collect my thoughts here, in the vision that Bob Jones had where the Lord spoke to him, and he said, Bob, in the time that's coming, and again, I'm paraphrasing, the gathering together of people is not, the power of those gatherings is not going to be determined by the number of them. Now, I'm not saying the Lord said these exact words, but I'm trying to give you understanding of the idea. And he used, you know, I found that God will use in, unconventional. There are not many ministers would use a poker hand to illustrate a point, but I am convinced that what Bob experienced and then uh, yesterday what I experienced by uh, seeing this uh, this poker hand uh, was the Lord. And, and here's the point. He says in, in this game in poker, a four of a kind beats a full house. Our mentality is let's go where the biggest crowd is. Let's go where the most popular speaker or the most popular singer. I've seen this for 40 years of ministry. You can have the most anointed person on the planet. See, we always assume that anointing equals everybody knowing them and popular. It's not always so. I think God's got some truly hidden people in the world that will remain hidden perhaps until the end. So my point being, we tend to value the large, and I'm not speaking against the large because the Lord is in the big. It's not like God is in the small and God is not in the big, or God is in the big and God is not in the small, okay? God is where people genuinely, without a desire to be elevated themselves, lift up the Lord. And so what God was trying to illustrate, I believe, to Bob and to myself in this dream yesterday was don't diminish the power of just a few people coming together in faith to believe, to ask and to believe and to expect what it is that they're, they're interceding for. Four of a kind. Getting four people into unity, that may sound like a super simple thing, but I guarantee you it's not, okay? A few people in unison, in unity, and not uniformity, not everybody doing, you know, being the same kind of a person. That's all we're talking about. We're talking about agreement with the heart of God has more effectiveness and power with the Lord than just because there's a thousand people in the room. You get what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, sometimes that thousand people, hi Celeste, God bless you, Debbie. 
or wait a minute, that's Carla, sorry. <laughs> I need some more powerful glasses, I think. <clears throat> I've been to many meetings through the years. I've been in some really powerful meetings that are large. Uh, sometimes that can be mistaken for hype. I went to a hockey game not too long ago and there were a few thousand people in the room and there was a lot of energy. And you could easily mistake energy and hype. One of the things I noticed about the game, I don't go to you know big ball games and stuff just because I don't have the money and I don't have a big interest. But So it was kind of a shock to me how they had to constantly keep the people hyped up. I mean, they would play the hockey thing and then they would put the sign up, everybody stand, everybody shout, everybody wave your little hanky, you know, and then they would put the, the camera on there. I mean, all, I mean, it was an unending, you know, chain of keeping people hyped up. And, and I'm not saying that was bad. It was fun. It really was. It was fun. It was entertaining. I'm not, it's not wicked. I, yeah, that's all I'm saying. But you could easily mistake the that kind of energy and hype for the power and the presence of the Lord. And see, we can do that as worship leaders. We can do that as preachers. You know, it doesn't take a lot of uh, understanding of, of uh, human nature to know how to get people to respond to certain things. You know, you walk into a building and you just, you know, of certain people and you just shout the right thing. Have you ever been to a rally for a particular political thing? You know, if uh, if you were to go to a Trump rally, let's say, for example, and you were a guy that was coming up before, you all you'd have to do is get up and shout, oh, I love Donald Trump, and, and the crowd would cheer. We can do things to get people to respond, but that is not impressive in the eyes of the Lord, okay? Uh, and again, I want to be careful. I'm not saying those things don't have their place, because I think they do, you know, but um you know, depending on the, the, the cause and all of that. But here's how the Lord sees that. He sees the widow's might. He sees the heart. He sees the genuineness. And above everything else, I believe he sees faith that is coupled with agreement. Do we agree with the Lord? Our meetings can degenerate into something where I just want to feel good. I mean, honestly, I just want to be blessed. Call it being blessed. Call it encountering the Lord. Call it whatever you want. But I just want to go in and feel good. <laughs> you know, I think, and I don't want to get on a hobby horse here. It's not like I'm being negative against the body of Christ. I love the church. I really do. I love the bride. But I do think we need to be careful that we remember when we come together, it is to first, I mean, there are other things, but first minister to the Lord. It's kind of a lost art. What does ministering to the Lord actually even mean? It, it, besides it just being a phrase, it sounds like a cliche. I minister to the Lord. Now, what does that actually mean? It, does the Lord, the idea of ministering to someone insinuates that they have a need to be ministered unto, okay? If I'm going to come and minister to you, it's because you have a need and I have something to give you. And we kind of think that God doesn't have any needs, okay? There's nothing that God needs. Well, actually, there is, okay? And um, that's another. that's another thing. But agreeing with his heart, that's a need he has. He looks for those who will agree with him. The father seeks, okay? What does it say there? Jesus with a woman at the well. Look it up. He said, the father seeks, S-E-E-K-S. -E -E he is looking for, he is seeking something. Now, in that context, he says, the father seeks such people in the spirit and truth to worship him. The father seeks worshipers. That's apparently a need. Not like a need like, oh, I'm going to perish if I don't have a kind of a need. Not like our fleshly needs. Oh, if I don't, you know, breathe the air, I'm going to die or eat food, I'm going to perish. That It's different than that because the Lord, you know, the needs that he has is stuff that he has voluntarily submitted himself to, the, uh, <clears throat> the agreement of mankind. God searches for those who will be in agreement with him. So, I wanted to look this up this morning and say, well, okay, well, let's, I just want to verify on the uh, internet. Ratna, God bless you. Nice to have you. I just want to look up on the internet and see if four of a kind actually does beat a full house. And so I, I put it on there. I don't normally do that because I don't like giving references to stuff like that. But anyway, I, in the link, I put it there. Oh, and by the way, I also put in the link a great song that my friend Jason Hubbard sent me this morning. Jason, if you're watching, I love you so much. I want to see you again. 
And um, it's called The Lion of uh, Judah Roars or something uh, to that effect. You'll be blessed. I listened to it, I don't know, four or five times. Full house does not beat four of a kind in this regular game. So I looked it up and it actually said, yeah, that's true. Okay. Four of a kind. What does that mean? I don't want, I don't want to ramble on and lose the point. The point is this. You can do more for real with three or four people who are in agreement, even two. Jesus brought it down to just one person above you singularly. <laughs> and this does not diminish the fact that he hears your prayers. And, uh, but he really, God, we don't know how much God values partnership. Adding that one person into the mix with you multiplies the effectiveness of your prayers, okay? And again, it has nothing to do with how much God loves you. You know, lots of times uh, the Bible says uh, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. Uh, lots of times God has used an, one individual who prayed and was faithful and has shifted things. But um, one of the experiences Bob had that I remember and have told many times on this program is that he died, short version, he died of a sickness, of an affliction in his body. He went to heaven, he saw the Lord, God told him some things, and then God sent him back. He literally rose from the dead. I was after I had a, quite a period of time. and uh, But when he came back to earth, he was still afflicted, which is not common. You know, 99% of the testimonies you hear about people who are sick and die, they come back healed, right? Because they've been to heaven. He came back, he was still afflicted, and he asked the Lord about it. said, Lord, why am I still, you know, this is not how this is supposed to work. And the Lord spoke to him and he said, Bob, when you go to the church, to the body of Christ, and do like it says, call for the elders and pray, I will heal you. And the reason I'm doing this, now listen to this, is because I don't want you to think that you can do this alone. You see, there is a great human tendency in us to feel like we can do it alone. And there's two reasons why that's so important not to believe that. Because if you feel like you can do it alone, you'll start acting like that. You'll start living that out. And here's what will happen. Number one, you rob other people of what you have. You're pulling aside, and it's just me and Jesus. You rob other people from the blessing of what you have. You're serving them and you're being in agreement with them and your intercession and so on and so on. And the second thing that happens is you get robbed from what they have to bring. No man, no woman is an island. Remember the old Simon and Garfunkel song, some of you are old enough to remember, I am a rock, I am an island. And a rock feels no pain. And an island never cries. You see, we withdraw from people usually because of the pain we have received. And typically, we can trace it back to some act of betrayal or, or someone hurt us or said something that we really never got over. Or it shifted the way we view how we relate to people. And so the Lord says the very first thing God ever said was not good was to be alone. So... Not just ministering to you and ministering to them, but there's a third component. So you have something to give to them. They have something to give to you. There's a third component. And that third component is ministry to the Lord. Yeah, you should listen to that song. That's a great song. Simon and Garfunkel. Um, yeah, I Am a Rock, I think it's what it's called. <clears throat> the third component is intercession. Let's read what the scripture says. So again, I want to keep coming back to this because I don't want to miss the point. The power of agreement. The power of agreement. The idea of the encounter Bob had years ago and the dream I had yesterday when I saw a hand, a four of a kind hand, and heard the Lord, or had the Lord remind me of this word, was that four of a kind, four people in unison, beats a full house of people or not. And I started to say this earlier, I've been in a lot of meetings. And sometimes just getting the people to all focus on the Lord and really go after what God wants to do in the room is an incredibly challenging effort. 
But sometimes it's actually a lot easier to get two or three people together that actually believe. We really believe that when we pray, we're not just coming together so we can sow, can get blessed. I love that too, okay? But we're coming together. I'm talking to intercessors now for the purpose, you know, of ministering to the Lord about things that are on his heart that he wants to see come to pass. And we actually believe he's going to do it. We believe that when we pray, when you pray, Jesus said, Jesus said, not your preacher, Jesus said, when you pray, believe that you receive it and you shall have whatsoever things you ask. And we know there's contingencies to that or caveats to that. You got to pray according to whosoever prays according to the will of the Lord will have what they say and so on. The idea is agreement with him, not trying to get him to agree with you. So, all right, you can't do it alone. And there's power and agreement. One will chase a thousand, two will, but how many? 10,000, that's tenfold, just adding one person, okay? So I want you to remember throughout this program that you, apply this to yourself, you need to find people who are in agreement with you. Oh, I forgot to say, when I looked up this uh, passage, Actually, let me read it to you real quick. This is what the internet said. And again, I'm not advocating cards. But I'm not. So don't get on your religious high horse. This is what was said. And I put the link at the bottom if you want to check it out. Full house and four of a kind both represent extremely strong poker hands. Now, are you thinking about this? Full house being a, like a big full church service or gathering or four people in somebody's living room. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. I don't want to confuse what we're saying. It's not saying neither one has value. As a matter of fact, I love the way it says this. Listen to what it says. Full house or a full house, right? The, the large gathering and four of a kind, the small gathering, both, are you listening? Both represent extremely strong hands. Both of them. One of the things in our human condition is that we want to go either or. We want to go this side or that side. It's either this is good and that's bad or that's good and this is bad. It's easier for us to go to one extreme or the other than to walk in balance, okay? However, the idea here in the spirit is four people in agreement is more effective than a whole house full of people who are not. All right, let's, let's read it. They're both extremely strong hands picking up one in a game of Texas Hold'em gives you a strong chance of winning a pot. I just thought this was funny because I didn't put the word Texas in there and I'd forgotten there was such a poker game as uh, Texas Hold'em and I'm in Texas. <laughs> okay, So yeah, write it off as coincidence, whatever. Anyway, so which of these premium hands wins in a head-to-head -head battle? Does four of a kind beat a full house? In this case, the answer is yes. Four of a kind beats a full house. Okay. And then something the Holy Spirit, if you happen to be following along in the comment here, um, that the Lord spoke to me. I heard him speak real clearly yesterday before I had this dream. He said, Jim, you don't always have to figure everything out. You know how it is when the Lord tells you something I mean, you might know something is true or not true, but when the Lord says it, it has this energy, this oomph to it, this power to it. And I know that. I've always, I've known that's true for years, okay? I don't always have to figure everything out. You don't always, and I feel again, this is a word for someone right now. You don't always have to figure everything out. You don't always have to know every nuance of the battle plan of the Lord. You just don't. As a matter of fact, he's not gonna do it. You need to settle in your heart. He no matter how much he loves you, is not always going to give you every detail. He's just not. Okay. Basically, without really understanding it, the mindset that we have is that we want to eliminate faith out of this. We want our security in knowing ahead of time. And he will not do that. Now, he'll show you a lot of things for sure. Okay. <clears throat> and I don't know who that's for. I don't know why the Lord uh, chose to say that to me at the time he did before this, but, but he did. And my assumption, I probably need to hear it, but somebody else out there needs to know, listen, you don't have to figure everything out, okay? You need to relax. You need to just, you need to trust the Lord. You need to ask him, okay? If, if I need to see something, please show me. I mean, there are so many things I wish I had clear revelation on. I really do, but I just don't have it. That doesn't mean I just go, well, he doesn't want me to have it. 
Say, Levi, no, I ask him. I do ask him. I say, Lord, what about this? Is there something here you want to show me? But I don't fret and stew over it. I ask in faith, and then I leave it with the Lord. Okay. Now, some things you have to contend with over and over and over. I get that. You know, uh, Jacob wrestled with the Lord all night. I get that there are times that that's so, but you can't do that with everything. There's just too many things, right? There are a lot of things you just have to say, Lord, I trust you. Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of me. You know, I want to know I'm serious about it. I'm not being casual about it. I'm asking you in faith. If there's something here, I'm not saying, please show me. And then the Bible says, when he does, don't be a double-minded person <laughs> or you won't be able to get the, the gain out of it. All right, let's look at the scripture real quick. Matthew chapter 18, 18. That's an easy, you ought to be able to remember that when you uh, click off the program today. Matthew 18, 18, look it up. Very important passage of scripture. And again, there are three verses I've got here. There's more that are applicable. And, um, and I have to be careful because three verses, I could easily go on and on and on for a couple hours, and I don't want to do that. But I want to stick to the main point today, this word from the Lord. And, and uh, my friend Scott Flore, if you're watching, Scott, I love you, uh, made, gave a saying once. I don't know where he got it or if he, somebody else, I don't know. But it's always stuck with me. He says, every analogy falls apart at some point. And that's true, you know, prophetic symbols, dreams, you know, cute sayings that we come up with, uh, you know, they always fall apart at some point. The only thing that, that is 100% is his word, his truth, and so on, so on, so on. Anyway, the whole four of a kind beats a full house. That's not meant to be some hard, fast, theological in every nuance of life. No, it just take it for what it's worth. The idea is that don't diminish the power and the effectiveness of a few of you getting together in faith, truly from the heart, believing what you do matters. Because you see, it's easy to get together and do things. And we're in this state of flux all the time. We, we think it matters sometimes and we don't. And then we do and then we don't. And we believe and then, and God is really merciful, right? He's really gracious. But he does want you to grab a hold of your heart once in a while and say, no, I'm going to believe. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If he says it's going to rain and it doesn't look like there's a cloud in the sky, I'm going to believe anyway. You know, even unto death. You say, oh, that's extreme. Well, it is the Bible. These all died. That's real death he's talking about. In faith, having not received the promise, in order that they could receive a better thing through other people picking up that torch. That's in the book of Hebrews. All right, <clears throat> Matthew 18, 18. He's gonna talk about this power of agreement, even with just a few people. Let's read it. Verily I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be. Now I want you to think about the word bind as being disallowed. I like that word because I feel like, you know, remember that words change in meaning and application over time. So it is possible to say the same thing with a different word, okay? We don't change the Hebrew and the Greek and all that, but sometimes our language is in a state of evolution or evolving and so on. And uh, the, the word bind, if it were not used in the Bible, probably would have kind of diminished. If, if don't, don't think I'm a heretic, that's all I'm saying. I'm just saying words change. You can think of words that, that you know, the meaning has changed because culture changes. All right. So bind means to disallow. Loose means to allow. Okay. And again, I don't want to go real deep in this because it's not my main point. But the idea that there are th certain things allowed in heaven and there are certain things that are disallowed in heaven. Sickness is disallowed in heaven. Poverty is disallowed in heaven. Uh-oh. Sin is disallowed in heaven. <laughs> violence, wickedness, you know, worship of, of idol. Okay, you get the point. There are certain things disallowed in heaven, and then there are certain things that are allowed. Peace, love, joy, freedom, you know, loving, honoring. All right, you get the point. So this is the famous, one of the famous verses that talks about bringing heaven to earth. The idea is very simple, trying to manifest the kingdom of heaven, what God allows and disallows in heaven on the earth. You are an agent of that. You are to challenge certain things. 
when things are happening that are disallowed in the heavenly realm, then God says, you're my ambassador. Do what you can do to bring heaven to earth and that say, well, okay, wait a minute. I have the authority of the king and I'm saying this is not allowed in his realm and his in the heavenly realm. And since this earth is his and I'm a representative of his, I'm going to declare that that is not allowed. You know, this is why we must be careful in our homes what we allow or disallow. Because it's not just about being legalistic or blah, 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 or you're super, super religious. No, no, no. It's about, I say, I want to go to heaven. And am I being hypocritical? There are certain things we know are not going to be in heaven, and yet I want them now. <laughs> okay. Those are some things God needs to work on, right? I mean, for my sake, if I say that I, you know, I want to go to heaven where there's no... Uh, you know, a vile speaking to someone, and and I and yet I cling to my right to do it now. That's just dumb. <laughs> we have to. We can't be hypocritical. Okay. So anyway, I, whatever's allowed, bound in heaven, you have the authority. There's some ramifications there. I don't want to go into them. All right. I, I just have to read on here. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Again, I say unto you. That Now, again, this is the very next verse. Sometimes we take these verses, and it's not necessarily wrong, but we separate them. We'll do a teaching of this one about, you know, uh, binding and loosing, and we'll do a teaching on this one about any two agree, and then we'll do a teaching on the third uh, verse about something else. And we kind of isolate them from each other, but they're really all connected. They all pretty much have the same message, and that is the manifestation of the kingdom of God through human activity. Okay, I'm going to say that again. The manifest, manifestation of the kingdom of God through human activity. The manifestation of what he permits in heaven through your human will and what you do. And when you come together and pray, that is one of the primary ways that his realm is manifested in this realm. Say, well, I thought this was his realm too. Well, no, it's not really, uh, not in the fullest sense. It's in it's in process. Jesus said it this way, okay? Or the scriptures say it this way. I say Jesus because he's the word. The heavens are the Lord's, it says. I can't give you the reference. It's in Psalms. You can look it up. That's what your uh, Google is for, okay? <laughs> your Strong's, whatever. The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. Now, what does that mean? That means he reigns in the heavenly realm, but the earth, okay, there's also, you know, the prince of the power, I won't get into that, but the earth is our realm of authority. The earth has he given to the sons of men. He gave it to Adam and Eve. He gave it to his descendants. He says, you go out there and subdue the earth and bring it under subjection. I've given you authority over the earth. I've given you, that's, that humanity is in training for what's coming next. So the idea is manifesting his will. You know, that's what an ambassador to another country does. They represent the country that sent them. And we are citizens of heaven. And we are sent into this foreign country. And we're called pilgrims and strangers because we are. And we are doing our best to promote, to clearly identify, and to help bring to pass the realm of heaven, the kingdom, the dominion of the king into this earth that has been given to the sons of men to rule and reign. Now, there will come a day when men and women will lose their right to the, the heavens are the Lord's, the earth has he given to the sons of men. That dispensation of men and women ruling the earth will come to an end. Jesus himself, have you gripped this? This is not a fantasy. It's not, this is not Disney. This is real. Okay. There will, the reason he's coming back is not just because he's super ticked off and he's just tired of everything. And no, he's saying, I'm given humanity a dispensation of time. It's been about close to 6,000 ish years. Don't, don't get me started on timelines. But he says, there is an end to that. The Bible talks about a revelation from the Lord that. I think it was Paul who talks about that the mystery, actually, no, it's in the book of Revelation. The angel, I think this is a reference when he puts one foot on the earth, on the sand of the seashore and the other on the sea, and he lifts his hand to heaven. He says, he swears by heaven and earth that time will be no more, but that the 
dispensation, whatever, of man will come to an end. The kingdoms of this world, that's the dispensation of man, will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. Friend, beyond just the hype of getting excited about it, it's truth that He is coming to take over. And again, I know for some of you this is so out there and so crazy. Listen, again, I, I, you know, people say, oh, that's just crazy talk. No, you know what's really crazy is to say you believe these things because you believe the Bible and you believe God, but not really believe it. We have to really believe that this is the plan of God and it's coming. All right, so let's get back to this verse. I'm running out of time. Again, I say to you, and again, who's talking here? This is Jesus. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. <laughs> okay? Remember who's talking here. Again, I say to you, and I feel like the Lord is saying, I'm saying this to you right now. I am his ambassador speaking on his behalf, but it is truly him saying to you. I feel a personal implication to this. If you're hearing me right now and you're watching this, the Lord is saying this to you, personally you, okay? Because that's kind of what this is about. The power of four of a kind with just a few people and really two of a kind, okay? I say to you <clears throat> that if two of you will agree, now that may sound like a super easy to think, but you know when there were only two people on the earth, one rose up and killed the other. <laughs> When there were only two automobiles in this country, Ford, I think it was Ford, made the first two automobiles, you know what happened? They got in a crash. It's true. Look it up. They got in a wreck. Okay? Listen, we're not always going to agree on everything. That is not what he's trying to say. You have to agree on it. Every single thing in life. No. No. Because of our individuality and our uniqueness, we're going to have disagreements. And our level of learning and our level of maturity. I think when we get to heaven, we will have the, the highest possible level of agreement that we'll have. He's not demanding that we're in perfect agreement on every subject there is. He's saying when you come together, determine what my will is. Now, there's a way to do that without fail, always getting it right, and that's going to the Scripture. When the Scripture says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance, there, that eliminates the guesswork. You don't have to guess whether or not you can pray for someone to be saved and come to repentance because he declared it specifically that that was his will. Now, other things, not so clear. I get that. <clears throat> but the ideas start out, and there's some things that maybe there's not a verse for, which actually I think are very few, but there may be a situation that feels unique and so on, and the Lord is saying, okay, you need to just, you need to even back up a step and pray what my will is. What is my will for this particular and unique situation? And try to come to agreement on that. And then if you feel like you have my heart, then I'm going to, the great intercessor, Jesus, I'm going to join with you in your intercession. And we're going to pray together. Okay? So it's not just you and another. And I, somebody people say, well, why didn't he say four? Uh, well, because I think he's trying to be really kind and say, listen, if you'll just get one, per you, you add one person to the equation. I just want to ask you real clearly. Do you have a single, even one person? I know some of you have many, but I'm talking to one who doesn't. Do you have even one person that you can call on the phone and ask for agreement? Now, please don't make me that person, okay? <laughs> Sometimes people's knee jerk is to do that. I'm a messenger. I'm not to be that person in most cases. But there is someone, I guarantee you, if you have not isolated yourself out of the will of the Lord, there's somebody in your sphere of influence that you can do this with. Now, if you've been betrayed, had your confidence betrayed in the past, it's going to make it harder, for sure. I think most of us have had, at one time or another, taken someone into our confidence, and now I'm talking about private matters, and, and been betrayed. I'm just trying to deal with the different aspects here. But don't lose hope, and don't let that thing prohibit you from finding a source of agreement. And again, I'm not just talking about getting someone to agree with what you want, okay? I'm talking about coming together, 
Now, it might be a personal need, but it might be a corporate need. It might be a global need. It doesn't matter. But you're in the room together, two of you, three of you, four of you. You're saying, you know, I, I, I'm going to pray about this Ukraine thing. Or I'm going to pray about, you know, our uh, election for our governor of our state. Or I'm going to pray about this family over here that uh, we've got a, a, a single mom, an unwed m mother who's about to abort her child. Or maybe just had a child. And she, you know what I'm saying? It could be anything. Don't always make it about you. That's all I'm saying. I'm trying to be nice. There are a lot of, we can be overwhelmed with our own stuff and that's all we ever pray about. And it's not healthy. It's not healthy. Matter of fact, I believe, it's my opinion, that it's best when you have a need to practice J-O-Y, Jesus, others, you. Begin by worshiping Jesus, by telling him how thankful you are, okay? Even through tears if you have to, but start out, we enter his gates with thanksgiving. They're the quickest way I know to come to the presence of the Lord is to be thankful and to actually say it, because there's a difference between being thankful, which means full of thanks, that's interior, that's inward, and thanksgiving, which means to actually give what's in your heart, okay? We enter his gates with, by giving thanks, by thanksgiving, so start out with doing that, and then others. And I know it's hard sometimes, right? I'm not just, I'm not saying there's some kind of a religious, legalistic way to do it. I, I'm just saying, sometimes we need to disassociate for a moment from our own even crushing need. You know, it, it, it hurts the devil when you set yourself aside for a moment and worship the living God and say, Lord, I love you and I thank you and I am not going to lose my confidence in you. And then others. Here's a great practice. I've done this many times. Maybe you've never tried it. Write it down. Try it. Start with Jesus. J-O-Y. Start with Jesus. Then go to others. Think of someone that is dealing with a similar scenario that you're dealing with. If you're sick, someone you know is sick. And don't give it a half-hearted attempt. Okay, really think about them, really think about their need, and, and then take time to sow into their deliverance and their provision before you do your own. I've had times where I never got to my own because the Lord just came and ministered to me in such a powerful way. Mike, is that you? There he is. I love you, my friend. God bless you. I'm closer to you than I've been in a while. All right, that's all I'm saying. <clears throat> okay, again. Jesus, I say to you that if any of you two will, if any two of you will agree on earth, he's back to this on earth versus in heaven thing, as touching anything that they shall ask, it will be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Again, these two verses, we typically dissect them, separate them, but he's still in the heaven and earth, you know, somewhat contradicting scenario. Okay? Things that are done in heaven are not always done on earth. One of the ways, I'm going to give you a golden nugget right now. One of the ways that you can come into agreement by agreeing with the heart of the Lord, not agreeing with each other so much, okay, that, that too, but the idea is that you're in the room together, two, three, four of you, okay, four of a kind meets a full house, right? And you're trying to get agreement. Agreement on what? Not agreement, well, I like you and you like me, so we're going to, oh, you have a need, I agree to that. No, what is the heart of the Lord? Okay, so this reference is to one of the ways to come into agreement is to simply look at heaven. Is this disallowed in heaven? Or is this allowed in heaven? You see what I'm saying? One of the quickest ways to be able to come into agreement, take your situation, say, okay, if we were in heaven, what would this look like? Because heaven is the ultimate expression of the will of God, okay? The ultimate. We all know this instinctively that in heaven, his will is always done, right? And there's no police force going around, and, you know, making people do it. It's always done. There's agreement. There's full, the power of agreement. Understanding that God's ways are always best. And I am foolish not to say yes to him for my own sake, as well as my love for him. So stop. Okay. And again, I'm painting a picture here. You're in a room. There's Three of you, four of you, two of you together. There's needs represented. It might be personal. It might be citywide. It might be global. It doesn't matter. Whatever the need is, what would this look like in heaven? 
Find out what it is you're attempting to be in agreement about. The starting place is how does God see this? Okay? All right. If any of you, and he specifically said, if any of you on earth agree with touching anything, my Father in heaven, there again, this concept of what is allowed or disallowed in heaven is not the same as on the earth. You're an ambassador doing your best to bring that to pass. And prayer is a non-negotiable component of bringing heaven to earth. Okay? That was, so that's worth repeating. Okay? Prayer, intercession, even in heaven, Jesus intercedes, right? Okay, intercession wasn't done away with when Jesus went to heaven. It was actually magnified. He is the greater sister. Prayer is a non-negotiable component of bringing heaven to earth. All right, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Okay, <clears throat> so the context here is asking, right? If any of you, two of you shall ask, ask, that's prayer, right? So you're coming together to pray. And then he said, we're two or three. He adds a third person in now. I like that. First, it was just, if any two of you, and then he adds a third, if any two or three of you come together in my name. Now, that doesn't mean you walk to the door and you say, in the name of Jesus, or you, you know, that's, it's not a routine. It's not a religious act. It is faith in the name represents the persona of Jesus. Thou shalt call, the angel said to Mary, his name, Jesus, because, okay, names are supposed to be indicative of something, of a person's character. You shall call his name Jesus because he will save people from their sins. What, well, what does he mean? Well, Yeshua, Old Testament translated in English, Joshua, same, same name. Yeshua means the Shua part of that name is salvation, and the Yah part of that name is God. Or the Lord, okay? He will save. God will save his very name. So when you come together in his name, you're basically coming together as if Jesus is with you in the room. Imagine how that would change our prayer meetings if we saw Jesus in the room. Yeah, I think there's actually a benefit. I know people don't like this and they'll disagree, but I think there's actually a benefit of seeing and your spirit, imagining a sanctified imagination, call it what you want, don't get hung up on words, the Lord in the room. I've known people that have seen the Lord in the room, opened their eyes and they, there he was. So, I mean, yeah. What would it be like if you're sitting in a room with the Lord praying your prayers? Well, first of all, you probably wouldn't attempt to be Mr. or Mrs. Articulate. You probably wouldn't do preaching prayers where really you're saying what you're saying because you want everyone else to hear it and admire how you pray. <laughs> There'd probably be a level of humility and brokenness and, and faith. You see what I'm saying? That's what it means to come together in his name. We're looking for his will. We're looking for him to agree with us because we're agreeing with him. We're looking for the great intercessor to make effective our prayers, our fervent prayers, okay? So he says, when two or three be gathered together in my name, there am I. I want to say this about that verse, and I'm gonna close up. I don't believe that is hyperbole. I don't believe that is metaphoric. I know there are people that do. I respect you, respect your opinion, love you, hope we don't divide. But I believe when the Lord Jesus says, I am in, I am there with them. He says, I, it's, he's not saying, yeah, I'm there in spirit. Or now you have my heart. And so it's kind of like I'm there, but really I'm not. And no, I think he meant it. I'm just one of those crazy people that actually believes he meant it. He is there. He says, you come together in my name. Okay, I'm going to show up. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there as the great intercessor in the room with you. And what we pray about it's going to happen. All right, so let me just circle back around for 30 seconds. The idea of this message was that I had a very short dream in which I saw a poker hand, four cards, and it was four of a kind, and the Lord reminded me of a Bob Jones word um, that was given years ago <clears throat> where the Lord spoke to him and said, 
four of a kind beats the full house. And uh, it's not to say the full house doesn't matter, or but we tend to think, we almost always, the more, the bigger, is this better. It's really about agreement with him. And it's simply saying that sometimes agreement with him is easier to get with a small number. But really, the most important part of the message is the fact that God doesn't want you to diminish how valuable and effective and important it is in his eyes for you to come together with just one or two or three people and, uh, and seek his face and be in agreement with him. Amen. All right. Well, God bless you guys. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Thank you for all of your, your shout outs and your ways and your comments. I would greatly appreciate it if you say something more uh, before you go. Again, you know how the algorithms work. And uh, one of the reasons I'm increasingly asking people to share is because I get people uh, now all the time say, even though I'm supposed to get notified, I'm never notified when you, when you come on. And lots of people, uh, the volume, it's a simple thing of them, whoever, you know, whoever the powers that be, turn off the volume. And this has become an increasing thing. So it's one of the reasons I download this to YouTube. If you ever have a problem with hearing the volume, um, the YouTube link is always on there. Uh, if you want, I would really appreciate um, uh, having you subscribe and get notification on the YouTube uh, channel. Uh, again, I, the only desire I have, I'm not looking for monetary gain from them. That is not at all. I just want to encourage people. That's all. I just want to encourage people before I go home to heaven. So you have to look up five words. Everybody say five words. Okay. And those five words are Jim Moore, words of encouragement. All five. Okay. Somebody said, why did you make such a long thing? Well, because when I did Jim Moore, there were 20 other ones. When I did words of encouragement, there were 20 of them. There's only one Jim Moore words of encouragement. So it's simply about ease of finding the channel. And when you get there, subscribe to it. There's always a little thing up on the side that says subscribe, just hit it. And then right next to it, there's always a little bell and you hit the bell and it'll say every time, part of the time, whatever, hit the bell. I always do all the time because I, I don't know when, <laughs> I don't know which one I want to hear as far as somebody else's, I, the ones I subscribe to. So anyway, look it up, Jim more words of encouragement, subscribe to it, hit the notification bell. And it'll, I try to get that on there every single time. So as a matter of fact, I, we're on a number of um, uh, channels now, and uh, <clears throat> it's probably about time I make an update on that. We're on Getter. Uh, we're on, I think we're working on getting on Locals and Rumble. Um, yeah, we're on a number of them. So we're just trying to make it easy for people to find us. So. Anyway, God bless you. We love you. We thank you. I thank you. Pray that it blessed you today. Father, bless your kids today. Give them great joy and happiness as they strive to walk with you as close as they can today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure hit the like, comment, and then share it with one person, okay? And do that for me, and I love you more. God bless you. Have yourself. Give yourself permission to have a great day. God bless.